Dan and I are very close. <laughs> and so I wasn't surprised last night when he called and said, what are you wearing tomorrow? <laughs> you look good, Dan. I know I do. Thank you. I love that boy. Good morning to one half of the greatest group of people in all the world. I want to say a special thank you as we get started today for uh, our family and Auntie Carol. The many, many cards and concern and those who showed such love to us and to her. We were out of town when she had her uh, episode. Is that a good word for it, Auntie? Episode? And, but she's up and moving and her ticker's still ticking and so all things are good. And so we thank you, Diane, we thank you for all that you've done and everyone, the cards and the visits. It's been, it's been greatly, greatly appreciated and it gave us great comfort being all the way across the country and um, knowing that she had a family that loved her here with her. We're going to start today in our scripture reading of Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2. Dan has assigned us all this month the subject of addressing that Latin word which means image of God. What it means to live in the image of God. But this is family emphasis month, so we're going to kind of look at it through the lens of the family. How important is it that we understand and that we strive in our families to mold ourselves, not just individually, but as fathers, as mothers, as children, as grandparents, into that image of God. Because really that's what we're trying to mold not only ourselves, but each other, those that we love the most, into His image. Trying to become more and more like God. And when we look over in Scripture in Colossians chapter 1, and we examine verse 15, talking about Jesus, it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And there's a lot to be said in those few short verses, just a few short words, just two lines in the Bible. But it tells us that Jesus himself is that image of the invisible God. He is that reflection. He's that part of a God we can't see, who has made it intentionally that we can't see. Therefore, we have to have faith in order to have relationship with Him. Because without faith, the Bible says it is impossible to please God. Because you can't really choose Him and you can't really love Him without faith. And so, He is invisible by design, but yet He gave us Jesus as an image of His glorious self. So that we have something whereby we can see it. And although we did not meet Jesus face to face, humanity has. There were countless thousands who saw Jesus, who heard Him, who touched Him. And there were those apostles and disciples that were with Him day in and day out. For three and a half years, who ate with Him, who spent time with Him, who embraced Him. And then he even was born into the context of what we're discussing all this month. The context of family. And so I've often tried to wonder and imagine what it must have been like to grow up with Jesus as a brother. I imagine that's why his brothers had such trouble with him for the first little while. In fact, during his ministry, you know, Jesus' brothers were relatively critical. They came and tried to seize him. In essence, they thought he was out of his mind. At another point, knowing that he was uh, threatened in Judea and that his life might even be in danger, his brothers even suggest, you should go down to Judea. And I think that's because they don't say it, but you're embarrassing us. So why don't you go down there? You, I mean, you have more effect there. That's where people will want to hear you. But I wonder if some of that is just growing up with the Son of God as your brother. My sister, I kind of understand. My sister, Melanie, she is a goody two-shoes. <laughs> you know, I mean, she is. 
Still is to this day. And, I, and I've gotten to where I accept it and love her for it. But I'm telling you, when I was 16 and she was 14, and every single thing I did or slipped up on, mom and dad knew. And I didn't have to ask why they knew. Because I had her as a sister. I called her, you're just a Pharisee. I mean, for years and years. But I could kind of imagine. I mean, I don't think Jesus, because she did have her, she, her weaknesses. I mean, she was a human, human being. But imagine having that and you can't even find any weakness in him because he just doesn't have any. That would have been, that would have been an interesting dynamic, wouldn't it? To have grown up in that household. But I think it's an important thing for us to examine. Because if we're talking about being transformed into the image of God, the Bible tells us Jesus is the very image of God. And he grew up in the context of a family. Therefore, there's something there for us to learn in regard of how to, to mold ourselves and our families into that image of the Almighty God. Now, the scriptures don't give a lot of information in regard to Jesus' younger years. But they do give some information. In fact, when we look over in this text in Luke chapter 2, verses 51 and 52, this is immediately following the incident of Christ as he's 12 years old, he's there in the temple in Jerusalem. They would travel every year for the Passover to Jerusalem, as all faithful Jews did. So it was kind of like the family trek to see the grandparents every summer, you know? I mean, can't you imagine that they had a caravan, but if, they had, if there had been Caprice pl Classic station wagons back then, Joseph would have owned one, right? And I mean, the whole family would have trekked across the country once a year to attend the Passover. And so they go in this big caravan as their family, and then they start heading back home, and they kind of just figure Jesus is there with them. I don't think they were scared about Amber Alerts and all the things we're nervous about with our children today. So they just, they had big extended family cousins and, and aunts and uncles. And so they just made an assumption that Jesus is there. Until they start looking for him. And he's not there. And I can just see Mary, because we haven't ever misplaced our children for that long. But... For a few moments at times, one time Seth thought it was funny, you know, those circular clothing racks. He thought it was hilarious as a little boy to hide in the middle of those when his mom's searching around the store. He only thought that was funny once. <laughs> it was only funny once because his mama didn't find it funny. She was in frantic mama mode, and that's how Mary was. I mean, no doubt, frantic mama mode. They're looking, they can't find him. She's terrified. Whoa, what's happened? Not only has she lost her child, she's lost the Son of God. That's pretty serious. So they head back to Jerusalem, and they find him. Where is he? He is in the temple. He's asking questions. And he's been doing this constantly since they've been gone. And it says that the elders are marveled at his questions. The maturity, the, the interest, the intellect of this young man, this teenager, it just absolutely is, is amazing to them. And his parents, naturally, he gets the talk. Just like Seth got the talk, although I think he probably didn't get it quite as firmly as Lenora's talk. But he gets to the talk, and he answers, and I'm telling you, this probably didn't make it any better. Well, did you not expect that I would be about my father's business? My mama would have saw that as a smart mouth answer. I don't know if his mama did. But she would have saw it that way. But he just states, did you not know that you'd be about my father's business? And the reason we know that his parents were able to accept it is because they knew it wasn't rebellious. And the reason we know that is because in these next two verses, it tells us how things progressed from there. It says that he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and he was subject to them. But he kept, his mother kept all of these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor 
with God and with man. You know, when we think about our children and the way that we want them to grow, to mature, what they want, what we want them to become and to grow into in their lives. We dream of providing an environment in which they can thrive toward excellence in every area of life. Don't you? We wanted that for our children. I wanted them to be excellent in every area of life. I wanted my kids to have good social skills. You know, and people like to be around them. We wanted our kids to have good intellect and be able to study and to learn. We wanted our children to be successful in their work and in their career and in their spiritual lives. And so this verse is quite important because that's what it describes. It says, Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with man. He was socially skilled. He was spiritually devoted. He grew in wisdom. He intellectually he grew and advanced and excelled. And in stature, physically, he grew, advanced, and excelled. And so the very objective of parenting was accomplished in that home. And we might be tempted to say, well, of course it was. He's the son of God. How hard of a par would parenting the son of God be? I think it'd be harder than we might anticipate. Much harder. There was a song that came out several years ago. And it didn't really become all that popular, but it was on country music and it was called It Wasn't His Child. And it's all about Joseph. And it starts off, he was her man, she was his wife. And late one winter night, he knelt by her as she gave birth. But it wasn't his child. It wasn't his child. And then the boy became a man and he took his father's hand. And soon they watched him grow. But it wasn't his child. Can you even imagine the burden of responsibility? You know, we don't read about Joseph after this instance. We assume that he died. Because, you know, I, 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 that doesn't surprise me. Life expectancy was shorter then. People died all the time. But talk about the weight of the world on your shoulders. Joseph was a good man. Because this wasn't his child. He came, stepped in and was a godly father to the Son of God. And that had to be tough. You know, I'm... I, I always think of this whenever I see a, a, a movie or read a comic or a book about Superman. You remember, I, have, you ever, have anybody ever seen any of the Superman movies, any of them that depict his origins, right? And we know this is, you know, a fantasy. It's not real. It's fictional. But you have this ultra high powered individual who's trying to grow and his daddy won't let him play football. Why? He'll score a touchdown every single down, right? And he might accidentally kill everybody on the other team I mean it could happen and you see that dynamic that tension of I'm not like everybody else no but son you have a higher purpose and I always feel for you know Jonathan Kent as he's trying to to coax and train and teach Clark Kent that no, there's something more important than all the other things it means to be a kid. There's a burden of parenting on Mary and Joseph like none of us have ever experienced that have raised our children. It was not easier to be his parent. In fact, I would say that it's much, much more difficult because he was different. Gloriously different. But being different, and I don't care what 12-year-old in the world you're talking about, even if he is the son of God, being different is tough. Being different is tough. So they raise him, and the results are fantastic. 
Now, we might also think that, well, yes, okay, so they had to emotionally help him through all the difficulties. But what we read, it says he was submissive to them. In other words, he was obedient to them. And we might assume that, well, he was just naturally obedient. He just was born that way. He's the son of God. He can't do any wrong. But right in there, we have that one little word that's a mistake. He can't do any wrong. The Bible never says that. Never once. It says he didn't do any wrong. But it never says he can't. In fact, Hebrews lays out for us very specifically, very clearly, that he was tempted in every way, just as we are. And it uses the word tempted. It doesn't try to paint a picture that he, you know, saw all the different things that were tempted by. It says tempted. And tempted doesn't mean that it's something that some people could do, but you can't. I've never been tempted by anything I couldn't do. Never been tempted to brag about my yacht. You know, never will. Unless somebody, anybody got an extra yacht lying around? I mean, then maybe, but no temptation to brag about my yacht, right? No yacht. In fact, James chapter 1 tells us that each man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desire. When desire has conceived, then it gives birth to sin. You see, Jesus had the desire when he, when he was tempted to turn the stone into bread. Do you not think his hungry old self wanted to turn the stone into bread? Part of him wanted to? You see, you can't have dis temptation without desire. But you can't have temptation either without opportunity. If Jesus was tempted, because it's not tempting. I mean, if he knows, he knows all. He's the Son of God. If he knows, I can't turn that stone into bread because I can't sin. Then was it tempting? No. That's why I say, and I believe, Jesus didn't just save me on that cross. He saved me every decision he made. Every day. Talk about a man of sorrows. With the weight of the world on your shoulders you ever feel like you got a lot of stress and responsibility it doesn't even come close because he saved you every time he said no to every temptation he saved us with every decision the lives and the and the, the eternity and the ransom for all mankind weighed upon his shoulders with every choice. Not only that, he had to learn that. You know, we learn obedience through that godly example trying to help us be molded into the image of God because we see parents who, although they fall short, are trying to live in the image of God. And in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8, this is a, such an interesting text because it says, though he was a son, talking about Jesus, Yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Now, that one just kind of flies in the face of what we assume about Jesus. How would the Son of God have to learn obedience? It doesn't say he was obedience. He says he learned obedience. That means he learned obedience in the same way you learned obedience and I learned obedience that's why God gave him Mary, an earthly mother. And that's why he gave him Joseph, a human father. He learned obedience. Now, he never sinned. Because once he got to the point of where he had knowledge of good and evil and right and wrong and was no longer a child, he made the right choices. But while a child, his parents had to teach him obedience. They had to teach him to conform to the image of God. The human part of him, and he was 100% God and 100% man. Colossians tells us that all the fullness of the Godhead dwells in him bodily. He was both God and man. He was the bridge, the mediator between God and man, according to Paul's letter to Timothy. And to be a mediator, to be a bridge, you have to touch both shores. A bridge is no good that only touches one side. It can't bring the two together. 
So that meant he had to be completely God and completely man. Completely. And his human part, that part of him that was found, that was humanity, had the same independence and rebelliousness that we all struggle with. That we all struggle with. I love being around little Manny. Manny is our grandbaby in training. That's what we think. <laughs> and Manny, what I love about him is he is a fireball of spirit. That's the best way. That's the best kind of kids to have, you know. A fireball of all spirit and will. And Dan and Aurora do a very good job because the objective of parenting is to break the will without breaking the spirit. Right? And Mary and Joseph, without question, accomplished that endeavor. Because, oh, Jesus has spirit. But he is submissive to the will of his Father in all things, even when it's agonizing to be so, even when he cries out three times, Lord, if there be any way, let this cup pass from me, but thy will be done. He had a submissive will, but a glorious, glorious spirit. You know, of course, it's uncomfortable to do that. I don't know if how it happened in Christ's, you know, young years. I don't know if Mary sent him to the corner or gave him a time out. I don't think that was a Jewish thing, but, you know, I don't know. Or swatted him on the behind or did the Lenora Williams pinch. I don't know what it was. But I know this, in some way or another... Jesus, as a child, had to learn obedience. You know, of course, discipline when it comes to children is uncomfortable. And we've all heard the whole thing. I think I've probably heard this like 408,000 times when I was a kid. But the whole, this hurts me more than it hurts you. There is, I mean, it's a cliche. But there's a lot of truth to that in a parent, right? Because you want your kid. I mean, we all want our kids to have everything. We want them to be so successful and so happy in all things. But yet we know that they have to learn that submission to authority. They have to learn to conform to that image. And in that process, I, I think that's God's God-given um, Defense mechanism against child abuse. Parents that love their kids with all their heart, as long as it does hurt you in some emotional way, more than it hurts them, well, that's quite a powerful governor, isn't it? It's a governor to not take things, because the, the objective is training and molding and transformation. So we have to understand that a faith without obedience can never be transformed, can never ever rise to the level of, of portraying the image of the Almighty because the very first sin was a lack of, of obedience. And if a child can't obey his parents, he can't obey the law, he can't obey the courts, he can't obey his boss, and he can't obey God. And Jesus, even Jesus, had to learn obedience so that he could be the image of the invisible God. So obedience is the objective of godly parenting. But 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7 through 9, says, Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who dis are disobedient, the stone which the builders reject, he has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word in which they were also appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
His own special people. That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You know, look, here we look and he's doing a, a, a before and after portrait. He says, this is what you were, but now look at what you are. Look at what you once were. No person is born with character. Character is something that's developed. Character comes through time by witnessing an obedient example. By witnessing people who, even though they fall short, are striving to reflect that image of the invisible God. That's why hypocrisy is such a severe problem. Now, weakness is not hypocrisy. I've heard folks accuse religious people of hypocrisy because, well, they don't think you should do this and do this, and then I see them do that. Well, that is hypocrisy if they're preaching one thing and intentionally, without any effort, doing another. But if they're weak, hey, we admit that's part of this experience, right? That's part of this life is weakness. I'm not always going to be everything or live up to everything I preach because I'm a human being. And the standard is above my fallible personhood. So it's not, it's not hypocrisy to fall short. What's hypocrisy is to say I don't fall short. And then intentionally just do whatever I want. You see, but hypocrisy is such a problem. When children see parents who are different at home than they are everywhere else and they see the real them as a person who's not really making an effort to be transformed to that image. It is not a parenting of rewards and punishment, but consistent training and never based upon moods of the parents that results in that obedient, transformed character with magnificent will, but a controlled, a magnificent spirit, but a controlled will. You see, we see so much of that. I don't think Mary and Joseph raised Jesus based upon their moods in the moment. You know, and people do that. You see that? You see folks who one moment, because their day's going hard, I mean, they're one way with their kids. But the next moment, when the day's great, they're just so loose on everything. It's just moods, back and forth. And that means you're a slave to your emotions and your kids are a slave not just to theirs, but to your emotions. And so we have to be a people who understand that character is not something anybody's born with. It's developed. Our objective is not blind submission. I don't serve God in all things by simply saying, well, I guess I got to do it because he said so. And there's a time and place for that. When your kids are five and you try to explain them why you can't put your finger in an electrical outlet, it's probably an okay answer to say, because I said so. Why? They can't understand electricity at five, right? But as children grow older, let me tell you, when it's just, well, because I said so, because I said so, because I said so, then... That is an insult to their intelligence and it's intended to break their spirit and their will. That's not the objective. The objective is to train them to be thinkers for themselves, to be able to make good decisions. And so, you know, when I, and God, there are things in Scripture I don't understand. And I probably never will. But I'm trying to. And when our children are being raised, and I can't imagine that Mary and Joseph, every time, no, you can't do this, no, you can't do that. And Jesus, why? Because he was a question asker, right? I mean, in the temple, he's asking questions. Can you imagine they always just, because I said so? No, it was about developing him, training him, building character. Robots don't have character. They are obedient most of the time. But they don't have character. 
The objective, you see, to be transformed in the image of God is not just to, not just to be just a robot. To be transformed in the image of God is to be a thinker and to have a glorious spirit, but to be able to conform our will, master ourselves. And that starts at home with parents who look to the image of the invisible God in Jesus and themselves are trying to live out that image. Imperfectly, yes, but striving. Their motive is to be that. And your kids always know your motive. They do. And then training children so that they have the ability in themselves when they're out on their own to make those choices. All this month, we're talking about families. All this month, we're talking about the image of God. So as we're raising our children, shouldn't that be at the forefront of our thought? What does it look like to be the most like God we can be as humanity? And am I raising my children with that as my polar star? We should be. This morning, if there's any need or difficulty in your life, if we can help you, encourage you, parents, moms, dads, if you just want to do better at this, if you want to have that objective in mind, Parenting isn't easy. It wasn't easy for Mary and Joseph. It'll never be easy because we live in a world that is anti-character. But yet we're striving to mold and develop a person. I mean, how, how challenging is that? To develop and to mold character in a human being that has their own thoughts and ideas and will. and Oh, it's not easy. Thank goodness God gave us a support network. If we can help you, pray for you, encourage you in any way, come right now as we stand and as we sing.